I'd like to thank the uh, Winter Star Party uh, folks for inviting me to do this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to miss everybody this year, of course, at the Winter Star Party and hope to see you all next year. It's one of my favorite places, been going there for decades, so I hope to see you next year. So th this is a little story about my life and how uh, appreciative I am and how lucky I've been throughout my whole life in terms of uh, family, astronomy, uh, business, and uh, so I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. I thank my lucky stars. That's the title of this, uh, of this talk. It says how a kid from the Bronx with a love of astronomy went on to create optical systems that bridged astronaut training with products to enhance the visual impact of our wondrous universe. On the left side is a picture of me uh, just out of high school with my 8-inch scope. In the middle is a f view from inside the LEM simulator. And on the right side is my patent for the original Nagler eyepiece. This is a picture from an article in an Australian magazine, astronomy magazine. Uh, but uh, it's, I, I really enjoy this, but it's not exactly correct because uh, when I grew up in the Bronx, we used these pink spalding balls to slam the uh, ants on the, on the ground and uh, n not optics, but I appreciate the concept. So my father took me to the Hayden Planetarium when I was about 13 years old, and that really got me started on my astronomy journey. I then joined the Junior Astronomy Club at the Hayden Planetarium, and uh, in fact I used some of my uh, talents as a model maker to make this uh, version of the a model, a model of the 40-inch Yerkes Observatory refractor, which uh, they placed the model in the astronomy club's showcase at the Museum of Natural History uh, associated with the uh, Hayden Planetarium. So my next big step was uh, what to do in the future for astronomy. Uh, I had a skyscope telescope when I was an early teenager, three and a half inch reflector, and I dreamed of having a bigger telescope. But nobody made bigger telescopes that time commercially, and I couldn't afford it either. So I knew I had to build my own, and I couldn't figure out a way of doing it except for the fact that I was enrolled in Bronx Science High School which had a class called Scientific Techniques Laboratories. And this allowed you to do any project you wanted. So I literally spent a year designing and building an 8-inch reflector and uh, wonderfully uh, afterwards I got the shop award because I built that and that allowed me to write an article for Mechanics Illustrated magazine, which you see here, uh, called Reflecting Telescope. And it shows the, myself, uh, in, this is about 1954, I graduated high school in 53, and I started City College in the evening. My father had passed away just before I joined, uh, I went to uh, Bronx Science, and uh, so I needed to uh, have a job to uh, have the rest of the family uh, have income. So I took various uh, p jobs in drafting and uh, other things, but in the meantime, I kept my hobby up, uh, my love for astronomy, and um, used this 8-inch telescope that I got this article for. So you, you can read the whole articles from the 1955 December issue of Mechanics Illustrated magazine. So since about 1955, I have been going to Stellafane, which is the birthplace of telescope making in the United States. That's in Springfield, Vermont. And I've been bringing that telescope there for, for a number of years. 
And in 1958, I was awarded a third prize, and that kept my enthusiasm going. So this is my 8-inch telescope updated a little bit uh, by 19, 1958. So then, <clears throat> a few years later, uh, having been lucky enough to marry my, uh, my darling Judy, uh, she accompanied me to Stalafane, and at, I rebuilt the original 8-inch telescope <clears throat> into a 12-inch, which I used for astrophotography as well as visual. You can see here, there's a picture of the double cluster I took with uh, ASA 100 plus X film, an 80-minute exposure, guided with this uh, instrument and because of this it turned out I not only won first prize in 1972 at Stellafane but there was an article about building the telescope in the Sky and Telescope um, issue, issue covering the uh, convention so that's a picture of me with the perforated diagonal which I used to put about five inches equivalent aperture of light to a tracking eyepiece and ten inches of equivalent of light to the primary mirror so I could guide perfectly uh, with this uh, instrument. Going back to my time after graduating high school, something really special happened um, after I got the article published in Mechanics Illustrated in 55 and I had various jobs in the drafting field and um, I realized that Earl Brown, a scientist, worked at uh, the Ferrand Optical Company in the Bronx as, as an optical uh, engineer and I lived in the Bronx so it seemed natural for me to apply for a job there. So I did, and fortunately, when after Earl looked at the article, he said, you're hired. And I was a draftsman there for about a year when the company asked me to join the optical design department where I was able to work on an incredible variety of projects. And I learned the art of optical design through my mentor there uh, Marty Schenker, who also graduated Bronx Science actually before I did. So, so one day they came over to me and said, Al, we have a new project. We're going to build simulators for the Gemini and Apollo program to train the astronauts to land on the moon. How would you like to do some design work on that? And I thought about it a thousandth of a second, and I said yes, and so I had the project of designing the optics for the Gemini simulator and the Apollo LEM simulator which trained the astronauts to actually land on the moon. This is a picture of the LEM simulator and you can see the triangular windows on top which most people are, are familiar with. So that's thanks to Earl Brown and the Ferrand Optical Company and you can see why I thank my lucky stars. So here's a picture of an astronaut inside the simulator viewing through one of the lunar module triangular windows. Now the simulator projected like an eyepiece the view of Starfield and the lunar surface through an optical system that's projected through that triangular window and here's the, here's the output of that optical system with the technician checking out the performance looking through the triangular window of the simulator that would be pressed up against the triangular window of the actual uh, unit. And this next picture is of myself, Marty Schenker, my boss at Ferrand, and Matt Bound. This is a picture fairly recently because the TechWorks Museum in Binghamton, New York uh, received the, an actual LEM simulator 
that they're trying to rebuild to be able to show the public what the simulation was and so the public would be able to see what the astronauts saw looking through the simulator. On the left is Matt Baum, a, a very dear friend who worked at Ferrand, also graduated Bronx Science and was the chief electrical engineer for this uh, Apollo LEM system. So the three of us uh, got together again working with the TechWorks and we're continuing to work on that project and hopefully in the next year or two it will become available to the public. So here is what that simulator, complete simulator looks like from the outside. You can see various sections that hold mirrors and optical equipment and the, the doorway to inside the simulator. In fact one of my earlier versions of this kind of a talk I had titled quote giant eyepieces that swallow spacecraft at any rate that's that's the actual simulator down at the uh, NASA Space Center so here is the simulator part of the optics and the principle of how it works so it's like a giant eyepiece in in reverse it takes an image from a spherical mirror of a star field or a television screen and projects it to infinity to a, an, a pupil. As an eyepiece, it has unique specifications. It has an eye relief of one foot, a pupil size of one foot, and a field of view, apparent field of view, of 110 degrees. That's what the astronauts see looking through the window of their simulator. So here you can see this, uh, the principle of having a spherical mirror projecting to infinity. Uh, of course, you can't go through the focal surface. You have to put a beam splitter in the way in order to allow the light to go through. So this is the general idea of what it what it would look like where you have the focal surface reflecting uh, either the television uh, screen or a three foot diameter globe with uh, star stars embedded inside by ball using ball bearings and that was projected by the spherical mirror through the beam splitter to the observer and of course the vir virtual focal surface could not be seen and this is the actual complete layout showing the re relay mirrors which projected the celestial sphere and a TV input, a 36 inch TV with a spherical screen so it matched the curvature of the focal surface projected through beam splitters, correction lens and a special compressor lens that was that's that triangular lens that matches the window of the simulator so you can study this and in fact um, I wanted this to be publicly seen uh, it never never had I think before um, in, in a magazine and I arranged for astronomy magazine to work with them on a bio autobiography which included some of these pictures including the layout and the picture of the simulator and you can see that on our Teleview website if you look at the section called About Al and look up the astronomy story Life and Times of Al Nagler and this is what the aluminum sphere looked like it's a it's black aluminum three foot diameter aluminum sphere with a thousand embedded ball bearings which allow them to see stars down to fifth magnitude with natural sharp star images and in fact secretly I actually had Betelgeuse and Aldebaran stars and Antares gold plated as my amateur contribution I don't know when they discovered uh, that was not in the original prescription, but it sure made the uh, view look uh, more realistic to me. 
So that's how it works. And indeed, even today, at, here at Teleview, we use the principle of these ball bearings mounted on, in a black background with a little light shining on it to uh, create artificial stars for all of our optical testing. And here is a diagram of how that works. So the ball bearing is pressed into the surface of the simulator and the f focus of the ball internally corresponds to the surface of the main three foot diameter sphere. Then a, a small lamp shines a light on the ball that creates an artificial star image at the focus and it's a perfect way to train the astronauts. In fact, they used to train at planetariums, but once they got the simulator, it was so realistic, they never had to train uh, at, at uh, planetariums anymore for looking at their uh, sky uh, uh, views. The next part of the project is, of course, to be able to actually do a landing on the moon through the simulator. Well, they had the three-foot, uh, actually full-color uh, television set that was at the simulator, but they had to project the views on the surface of that, and they did that by making gigantic models of the lunar surface, and then having a type of camera called an optical probe mounted on a as you can see here in this picture, it's mounted with uh, where it can move up and down and left and right to simulate the spacecraft moving over the landing surface. So that allowed the astronauts to actually visually see the landing from some significant height above the surface down to the actual surface. But in order to do this, they had to have a special optical probe camera which was originally designed at Ferrand Optical uh, and then um, I'll show you how that would work because they asked me to do a new project at Ferrand a design of a 140 degree angle optical probe that's used for aircraft landing training with the same principles as the lunar probe and I'll show you why this is important to my career and I really have to thank my lucky stars for this also. So this is actually what the model of the 140 degree uh, optical probe looked like. It's pretty complicated. In fact, if you look at this diagram, it has 45 lens elements it has two relay systems that allow a tilt image to be placed in focus at the uh, camera surface because uh, this will be positioned so that the pupil of the camera lens in, in front of the simulator, it's just the front part of the, uh, excuse me, the optical probe, uh, will be literally a quarter of an inch from the surface of the model. And so you have an objective with sapphire prisms that went within a quarter of an inch of the surface. Now, if you're going to tilt the prism so your view is parallel to the surface, an ordinary camera will never be able to see that field of view because the optical axis is parallel to the surface. Normally with a camera, the uh, film plane has to be perpendicular to the optical axis. So in this case, the tilting of the relay lenses allowed the tilt of that focal plane to be uh, projected uh, properly in full focus. And I'll show you that in a little greater detail over here. This is the detail of the optical probe's objective lens, which has a principle very much like an eyepiece. You see two prisms there, and then in the middle of the prisms, that's the incoming pupil. And then externally on the right is where the focus of the optical system is. 
And I realized that after I designed this, that the principle using a corrective negative lens near the focal plane with an external pupil could be adapted to a wide angle astronomical eyepiece. And that was the germ of the idea for the original Nagler patented eyepiece, which you see below. So by 1977, I had left for Rand and joined Keystone Camera Company as chief optical engineer. And at the same year, along with uh, Judy, we founded Teleview Optics to eventually realize the goal of space war viewing through amateur telescopes because I wanted to see that, that kind of view through my telescope that I was able to see and the astronauts were able to use in the simulator. But to show how the optical probe worked, demonstrated, what I did was I created a model of an aircraft runway with some objects on it and then we used a camera, uh, a single lens reflex camera without the lens, the body, to place at the focal surface of the probe and which will look through the probe down the runway, parallel to the runway, so that the people who would be purchasing, it was, it was an Edwards Air Force Base uh, simulator, they would be able to see how well the probe was able to project the runway. So this is an actual picture through the simulator and I put some green fuzzy paper where the grass was. I even laid down a 440 machine screw and a penny for scale. Notice the entire length of the ground is in focus. That's looking out parallel to the optical axis not perpendicular the way a normal camera lens would. It took 45 lenses to be able to do this with the optical probe, but this is the essential way in which the lunar landing simulator worked and it showed why it was so successful in the project. I was told NASA demonstrated the moon landing experience to important guests. When Lady Bird Johnson, the president's wife, saw it, they planted a tree in the crater at the landing site. When the president of France saw the landing, it had a model of the Eiffel Tower there. And most interesting, when Neil Armstrong saw his first landing in the simulator, I was told fellow astronauts taped a live praying mantis to the landing site. Imagine that experience. Going a little further, uh, since I attend uh, Stellafane every year, in 2009, Alan Bean, the fourth man to walk on the moon, who's was in the Apollo 12 voyage, he gave a wonderful uh, presentation about his uh, experience landing on the moon, walking on the moon, and they held a dinner, which I attended, and um, before the dinner, I prepared a little booklet that I made with a picture of the simulated design inside and a picture of uh, Alan Bean in the simulator that I got from NASA. And on the outside of the cover, I, I wrote down, Dear Alan, glad it worked. And I handed it to him at the dinner and talk about a very special time and coming full circle. That was the experience. So going a little beyond that, we tried to create more and more of the experience in space beyond 82 degree field. And Paul Delacai, who has worked for us for decades as my protege learning optical design, and David, who joined us in uh, full time in 1988. Um, so in 2007, uh, David came up with the idea of the concept of doing a 100 degree eyepiece to recreate the experience, but even better than the original 82 degree eyepiece I designed when we first started the company. So the 100 degree eyepiece that Paul designed was, we all agreed, wonderful. In fact, it was so good that I felt we could push the shorter focal length models to 110 degrees while maintaining excellent performance 
so we could show the actual 110 degree field that the astronauts saw in the simulator. Here's a picture of the double cluster on the left side with a 26 millimeter parcel of 50 degree apparent field and on the right side is the 100 degree 13 millimeter ethos apparent field giving the same true field in the sky. With twice the magnification though you get twice the resolution and you get a four times darker sky backgrounds allowing you to see fainter stars giving a huge experience benefit over a standard plossal type eyepiece. This inspired me to write an essay called The Majesty Factor on our website to technically explain the wows that I heard from every Ethos viewer at star parties. The fact that Ethos shows virtually no aberrations such as spherical, astigmatism, distortion, color, with a comfortable 15 millimeter eye relief and no pupil aberrations was truly a milestone. Kudos to Paul and David. Further, with our newest Paracore Type 2, large reflectors as fast as F3 deliver more sharp field and reduce need to use ladders as well. So I, I've been involved in giving talks over the years to many organizations actually throughout the world from uh, Japan to Greece to uh, Germany and so on and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful trip and in the late 50s with the astronomy friends of mine we started the Rockland Astronomy Club and developed the Northeast Astronomy Forum called NEEF where we invited uh, wonderful speakers in this particular picture you can see we interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson I was sitting there and we interviewed him via Skype but we've had scientists and engineers uh, wonderful uh, astronauts over the years uh, exhibiting plus literally more than a hundred companies come and this turns out to be the largest astronomy equipment convention in the world today and I'm proud and happy to be a board member of the Rockland uh, Astronomy Club. Paul, David, and I celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing in this picture with a very special limited edition eyepiece we worked on together. Sorry it's all sold out right now, but it's possible some dealers might have it. The eyepiece is based on a combination of work we've done in the past, both on Nagler's and Ethos eyepieces, and the optical correction of this 85 degree eyepiece is exceptional in every area equaling or surpassing what we've done previously on the ethos. In conclusion, I can say that having a great family cooperating the way we do at Teleview is the reward of a lifetime. Judy worked full-time on the business side until retiring in 2008. We had the joy of our son David asking us if he could join in 1988 and having Sandy, his wife, join with us to follow in Judy's footsteps. Of course, turns out we have many other employees who are am serious amateur astronomers and that makes it especially pleasurable. With David's background in communications from Syracuse University, he moved the company forward in marketing, advertising, internet, and best of all as my partner on virtually all technical matters. He developed the 100 degree ethos concept, got the project going with Paul Delakai, a longtime employee and my protege in optical design. My name may make the headlines but without such an ideal partner as David, along with a great staff, we could never have gotten where we are. Thank you very much. And uh, please uh, look at our website, teleview.com, and our blog articles 
uh, you'll see an awful lot of information, an awful lot of interesting stories, and hopefully you'll have a lot of fun too.